Good morning, Tallahassee. It's time to wake up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Here's WarChant.com's Aslan Hajavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up. It's Wake Up War Chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio in Tallahassee. You already know our names, but again, I'm Aslan. He's Corey. The show brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. There are three great locations over in the College Town District, Central, Madison Social, and Township. Back at it for another week, Sea Dog. How are you, Corey? Good, buddy. How are you doing? Oh man, just just out here living the dream, man. One day, one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, man. What's uh, how are things in the A? You'll be back in Tallahassee with us here this week, right? I'll get to actually look into those. That's right, buddy. Back in the uh, the friendly confines, the eight five zero. Represent, represent. Good stuff, man. Looking forward to it, man. What's going on this week? Is there anything cool that we got to look forward to? Uh, no NBA games. Uh, uh no hockey games. Ah. Uh, uh, no, not really. I guess we could read up on all the recruits that were at Taggart's camp. Yes, we could. Yeah, let's try to get Michael Langston on uh, possibly today, if not sometime this week, to, to wrap up things and how that's going. What, how are the Braves doing these days, man? You guys have a legitimate uh, competitive baseball team in the pro ranks, don't you? Yeah, they're good. I, I Again, I can't quite get behind them yet. I, I just, I'm not buying it yet. Um, they still seem to have a couple of holes that I, I think the Nationals are a better team, but they keep... You know they're they're certainly in play, and they they should be in play for the postseason, like as a wild card. I just I can't I can't imagine that they have enough of what it takes to to win that division. But hey, man, who knows? They proved me wrong before, so I'm hoping. But uh, yeah, they're they're a pretty good team, man. They're a pretty good team, and I think they have maybe the best hitter in the league in Freddie Freeman. Oh yeah, sweet. That's Freddie. all I'm saying. That's all, right. all I'm saying. Laying it on the line, I like it. Um, by the way, I, I realized huge opportunity squandered. So we were going to do this whole quasi, not so much quasi list where we're going to count down the days to kick off. By the way, we're now 84 days, Corey. We are 84 days away from Labor Day, a.k.a. Taggart Day, a.k.a. T-Day, a.k.a. Opener versus the Hokey Day. So we could have been You know what a- I don't like about don't- Virginia Tech? Can we go ahead and just put all our cards on the table? I'm, I'm, I'm. This is this forum is open for your thoughts and your thoughts and opinions, friend. So, if the people that listen to the show that aren't on Twitter, you know, every football account has its own Twitter account, and they're all verified. They all have tens of thousands of followers. So does Virginia Tech's. Florida State's, I'm sure, has like a hundred thousand followers. It's they're huge audiences, and they're, it's a big deal. In Virginia Tech's football account on Twitter, for the last couple of years, had has made it its point. Anytime somebody brings up the longest bowl streak in the country, Florida State currently has the longest at whatever it's been since 1981. So you do the math, 38 years. But every single time ESPN, uh, Sporting News, CBS Sportsline, somebody tweets out the longest bowl streaks during bowl season, Virginia Tech's football Twitter account will always peep in and retweet it and say, nope, Virginia Tech has the longest uh, – the longest bowl streak because Florida State's uh, one of Florida State's bowls was uh, whatever, what, what the one the one vacated was, or whatever. Right? Vac- the 2006 Emerald Bowl was vacated, which is we all agree is nonsense. The bowl was played; they qualified for the bowl. They had the longest streak. But imagine being so petty as a program. And Virginia Tech's accomplished a good bit. They haven't won a national championship. It's a real program. It's a top twenty program nationally. Being so petty that you're like rooting for for uh, entities to recognize a vacated bowl from 12 years ago. So I hope Florida State beats Virginia Tech by 40 points until they get rid of whoever runs that football Twitter account and quit being so petty and goofy. Then I'm always going to root for Virginia Tech to lose. What about 38 points? What do you mean? Like what if they won by 38 points? Wouldn't that be more poetic that they beat Virginia Tech? Yeah, by the yeah, whatever the bowl streak is. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, maybe Virginia Tech won't go to a bowl. It, it just, it's like, man, what do you, you're a good bowl, you're a good program. Number one, that's an also an ACC program that's in there. You should probably be pulling for your own conference. Don't ever, always chime in to say, no, no, we have the longest bowl streak at 21 or whatever it is because theirs was vacated because of the dumb NCAA. It's just dumb. Nobody recognizes that stupid non streak. Florida State has the longest bowl streak in the country. They played in a bowl game for 37 straight years. Sorry, Virginia Tech. You weren't any good in the 80s. Sorry, man. Just live with it. Quit trying to, like, you know, uh, semantics your way into the longest bull streak and the longest active bull streak because you don't have it. Anyway, I'm off my I'm off my platform now. I'm off my soapbox, but I'm sure I'll step back on that thing a lot over the next couple months as we get ready for that game. Yeah. 
So we're 84 days away from aforementioned football game. This whole time, instead of trying to count down, you know, playfully, almost tongue-in-cheek, making fun of radio shtick, I probably should have just been playing, like, the best songs from 1994 when we were, like, 94 days away. I probably should have played the best songs of, like, 1989 when we were 89 days away. But that all failed to register in my mind until, um, you know, a few Well, you could ago. still do it now. That would be cool. At least for the next 10, you could do, like, the top five songs of 1984 and the top five movies of 1984. The problem will be is when we're, like, 11 days away. Right. Like, what was the top song of 1911? Just some, some whistling, Mozart nonsense? Just some whistling song from somebody in the in rural Oklahoma or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah, of, like, rural like Oklahoma. That. So I, I always, I try to, not these far-fetched towns, but we'll be in the midst of conversation, you and I, and we'll talk just about maybe perhaps, for an example, Florida State's footprint and how, um, you know, people in Tallahassee might care more about something as opposed to a Florida State fan in, say, Moline, Illinois. So, like, that's a city I threw out the other day, I guess. I got a direct message from somebody who said, you're totally wrong about that because there is somebody in Moline, Illinois, who does like the Knowles. It's me. Go Knowles. And I was like, look at that. I think I even said Amarillo, Texas one time. And then we got a guy, Wilson Lemieux, who's like uh, was a second-ever caller on the callback line. He was supposed to be the first guy, but I gave him the wrong phone number, uh, by the way. It's 850-7-YAKS-30, everybody. That's 850-792-5730. Uh, that's Call it up, leave a, leave a question, leave a comment, hopefully a pleasant one, and uh, you'll almost certainly get on the air. Yeah. yeah, man, it's crazy about the reach of this show, the reach of uh, headlines, obviously, of the Jeff Cameron show. Um, and, you know, when you look at, like, the top podcasts in the country, you know, we've talked about it before off the air, I guess, but Florida State, there's, like, five or six of them. Obviously, this one, Headlines and Jeff Cameron, are the three best. I mean, that goes without saying. I don't even Duh. know why I had to say it, but Duh. you guys know that. If you listen to any other ones besides these, you know we're the best. But either way, it's it's really remarkable how passionate Florida State fans are. And they're all over. And it, it's just – it's kind of – it's kind of uh, – you know, it, it occurred to me when I was looking at the podcast rankings and how there were a few different ones – they were all listed in the top ten. Like Notre Dame might not have had any. Florida State had four. Yeah. It's like okay, just people are insatiable. Their hunger for Florida State talk is uh is really kind of remarkable. I don't I don't know that there are other fan bases quite like this. I don't think so either, man. Look at the numbers, man. Look at the charts. Look at the charts and the numbers, man. It's uh it's all right there, uh, in front of everybody's uh, eyes in plain sight, man. But yeah, so we're eighty four days away. So how about the best number eighty four? Anybody stand oh. out to you? 84. Apparently, E.G. Hmm. Green wore 84 in 93, according to our friends at nolfan.org, who are uh, so legit, was, by the way. 19. You know, there's, a, there's like a scrapbook inside the traditions room at Hauser where we have those post-game press conferences for the baseball team. There's like this mm-hmm. huge leather-bound scrapbook. It's actually from nolfan.org. Like they accumulated like all these clippings from the baseball team and put them in this huge, massive, um, you know, collection in that album, and it sits there like on this table. That's how legit. Yeah, they are. yeah. I've, I've, I've flipped through them a couple of times just to read some of my great stuff from over the years. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's pretty neat. The tradition room at Florida State baseball is really neat. Yeah, I wish maybe they showed it off more. Um, that would be kind of cool to let fans come in and see like the Buster Posey exhibit and the James Ramsey exhibit, uh, you know, and all the people that are in the major leagues that they have some really cool stuff in the stadium, but it's not really out and about for people to see. I I would like them to change that maybe like to put, you know, that big plaza area they have out there. Well, it's not that big, but I mean, it could be bigger, but there is a plaza area out there, man, put something dedicated to Buster out there or JD drew. You legit have maybe the two best college baseball players of all time, certainly in the conversation, have something for people to see that aren't just walking through the bowels of the stadium. Why don't they put like plywood or just or just some sort of facade over the fence in right field? Like make it like almost like a quasi green monster, like make it the garnet, the garnet gargantuan or something. And then ha- instead of hanging those vinyl banners that they're going to have to update because Florida State won 40 games again. And then Florida State's going to go to Omaha, hopefully here soon again. Like, it just right. make make like this, you know, this long standing wall of just, you know, put all these cool things up there instead of having that in that wall and JD Drew's numbers between the scoreboard and the bullpen and left field. Like, that, just make a like make a wall, make a wall. Don't just put up a fence, make it a wall. Build that wall. Build it, Mike yeah. Martin. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, hey, man, I'm with you. I, it, they could do something more than just a big screen chain link fence, I guess. I, I, I feel like that could be cool. And it, um, it'd make a cool sound, the ball, when it hits the wall and it's a big thud and it bounces back to the infield. Yeah. Uh, you know, that'd be pretty neat. Yeah, the mar- the guard maroon. Oh boy, I'm gonna I'm not gonna have this job for very much longer. Take a lap. The the gar- yeah the garnet monster. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. I, everybody would love that. The garnet yeah, goblin you, man. or something maybe. I don't know. We got it. I'm all about alliteration. You know. You no, know, looking at this list. I mean, it looks Rodney like Rodney Smith. I mean, Bruce Lesane had it for one I guess season. Rodney Smith is your guy. I mean, like legitimately, we're not we're not being prisoners of the moment unless you guys happen to know uh, George I Alessandro mean, from back in sixty three through sixty five. Maybe he no some- no Garth Jacks. Garth Jacks was a nice player. He was a linebacker that played in the league for a few years, so he might be he might be up there. But uh, I mean, Jalen Wilkerson. He he was the, he was eighty four for a year. Yeah. Uh, but I would say it's yeah, it's either Garth Jacks or Rodney Smith. Look at that. Who would have Not been? a lot of great 84s. Yeah. At all. It's That's like, a tough number. Uh, it, it, you know, really good wide receivers apparently don't want to be in the 80s anymore. That could have been Randy Moss. You know, 84 is what could have been. Could <laughs> yeah, have been, it could have been. Could have been Randy Moss. It could have been. Oh, yep. There'd f- probably be a couple more banners in Dope Campbell Stadium if they'd have let old 84 hang around. A few of those. It should be 84. They, Randy Moss should still be. But, hey, I'm gonna. That's the answer. Randy Moss <laughs> is the best 84 in Florida State history. <laughs> Boom. So it is written and said. Hey, let's talk more about the Virginia Tech. Uh, there was something that came up the other day when I was doing the show solo that I never got to uh, bring up with you, but it's something that we're going to probably talk about throughout the summer, but I uh, might as well start now. It's going to be a long one. He's Corey Maslon's Wake Up War Channel. Coming right back right here on 97.9 ESPN Radio after this. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Wake up! I'm Aslan. He's Corey. It's Wake Up Board Chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio. Uh, show's brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Don't forget, folks, that great Father's Day promotion still running over on warchant.com. If you've never subscribed ever, uh, there's a whole lot of goodies in it for you. Six months free. You get a tumbler. Um, it, it's it's fantastic. FSU Dad's the promo code you want to use. If you're a past subscriber that had your membership perhaps lapse, no better time to hop aboard than now. Um, go to warchant.com, use the promo code FSU Dad. Uh, lots of good sort of um uh I can't find the right word, but it's a lot of little good perks, a lot of good perks, you know, bring you back into the fold, bring you back into the part of the fam, as Corey would like to say it. So, Corey, you were talking about uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, I was talking about Virginia Tech as well, real quick on the Twitter accounts. They've got sixty five thousand nine hundred followers. Florida State's Twitter has three hundred eighty thousand followers. Oh, Virginia Tech. Well, so okay, well now the envy makes sense. Yeah, that's Oh, that, that, I mean, there, there's some serious Twitter envy there. I mean, they're, they're, what are they? They're being outnumbered five to one, yeah. six to one. Good grief, Virginia Tech. You know, and I mean, not to, not to sit here and, and, and pontificate and, and to be like obnoxious, but that was a huge loss for them, obviously. I mean, I, I wonder if, I mean, I'm sure they're over it to a certain extent, but I'm sure to another degree that they're never going to get over that loss in the Sugar Bowl to Florida State. So I'm sure there has to be some sort of deep-seated resentment because they haven't been close to getting back into that into that position. And for, for one night, that school, for a few hours, uh, felt on top of the world and then abruptly uh, were brought back down to earth uh, by our old guy quarterback and that, that explosive special wide receiver that we had. Yeah, and uh, again, I, I was at that game because any oh, big of course, moment we're going to bring up in Florida State history, obviously I was there. Did you ever um, go to school, Corey? Did you just miss school all the time and just follow the Knowles? Come on, baby. That was December 30. That was January 1st, uh, 2000. I wasn't in school then, uh, and I just survived Y2K, so I was on top of the world. I thought we were all going to die. We're, we're actually living. The, the world didn't collapse, and I'm like, I'm going to go celebrate this in New Orleans. But I remember the, the two things about that game is – Right before uh, Peter Warwick's, like, ceiling touchdown catch, the bobbling one in the end zone, all the Florida State fans started chanting Peter Warwick during the TV timeout. Everybody started chanting Peter Warwick and started clapping. And then literally it's like Mark Rick was, like, taking requests. He's like, all right, I'll throw a ball to Peter Warwick. So they did the play action and put the game away. But so I remember that, and I remember – I I don't know that I've ever seen anything – but, I mean, I guess Lamar Jackson's the closest thing that, to Michael Vick that I've ever seen because that was incredible because yeah. Michael Vick was doing that against real defenses. I mean, that was, an inc- that was an awesome Florida State defense with a ton of NFL players on it, and he was running around them like they were in, like they were in sand. 
it, it was it was a really he's a just it was just incredible. It was remarkable. And, you know, they did have Virginia Tech had the lead in the fourth quarter of that game. I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah. Like Florida State got up 28 to seven and then kind of melted down. And Virginia Tech ended up taking the lead in the fourth quarter until Winky uh, did what Winky always did. Seemingly, as soon as they got behind late, he lead them right back. But that was a really yeah, and you're right. Like that was their chance. Right. I mean, I guess there's there's you know, it could happen again. The the, the stars could align and they could get another. They, and they've had some good moments. They've been to bowl games. They've won the. I mean, they've been to a lot of bowl games in a row. They've won the ACC. They've been to the Orange Bowl. Uh, they beat Florida State for the ACC championship that one year. But you know, they've had nice moments in the in the uh, subsequent eighteen years. But they haven't really been all that close to a national championship. And you're right. Maybe that maybe that still bothers them that Florida State took that one magical moment away from them. I'm sure it still gnaws in their craw or whatever the folks. Uh, that's their, God. That was 18 years ago. I know, man. Getting kind of old feels like. Oh my gosh. Hey, let's just do a terrible. Let's do a, ter- let's do a terrible stat dump, or not so much a stat dump, but just let me just poke fun at everything that I want to poke fun at. I hate, some of the stats I hate are like right now you're seeing it with the College World Series. North Carolina was the first team to uh, scan their ticket rather uh, to the College right. World Series in Omaha. Good, good job. Good and job. the and the stat was their first appearance since 2013. Like it's five yeah. years. Like, what? Why are we doing that? It's only been. Five you see that sometimes when it's like you'll hear like he becomes the first Braves player to hit two home runs in the in a in a from both sides of the plate since you know August of 2016. Yeah, and it's like, well, man, I thought you were going to say 1991. Yeah, 2016 isn't anything. Yeah, so you got that. Then there's the one thing that I've always thought was bizarre is just you know, like Florida State's all time record against Oklahoma has some sort of bearing on the game that they're going to play tomorrow, for example. Although that's maybe a bad example because I feel like Oklahoma has had the better Florida State. Well, they've, we lost three in a row to them. At least I know that much, right? National title game than the, than the home. Yeah, and I don't know that they've ever beaten them. They lost to them, uh, they lost to them in the Orange Bowl in 79 and 80, and then they lost to them in the Orange Bowl in 2000, and then they lost to them in 10 and 11. So, so at least five. At least five, right? Five in a row. Yeah, well, and they lost to them in Bowden's first year. So at least six in a row. Okay. Well, there you go. So maybe that's a bad example. But they'll use that sort of thing where... But that doesn't have anything to do... Like, if they if they were to meet Oklahoma in the playoff game this year, right? that wouldn't have anything to do... Well, you know, Barry Switzer beating Bobby Bowden's first team has zero to do... Or, or, or you know, Bob Stoops yeah. beating Jimbo's first team has zero to do with a game eight years later or 48 years later. Yeah. I bring that up because uh, when we were doing the Renegade Express and I, I was doing things um, by myself the one day, uh, one of the questions was about uh, Willie Taggart and his ability to make halftime adjustments. And I did this whole dive into whether or not how many times his team was trailing at the half, their win loss record and all that kind of stuff. And it was a little bit clumsy because it was just way too many numbers and just my annoying voice straight for like 10 minutes. But is there anything to read into the fact that, you know, Justin Fuente and Willie Taggart have played three times and Fuente has won every single one of them. And this includes, you know, 15 when Willie had a really good squad. I mean, shoot, I need to – at 16, I think he lost to Memphis. So maybe it's a Memphis thing. I need to probably look that up. But Fuente wasn't there in 16. Fuente had gone to, to Virginia Tech. But in 13, 14, and 15, USF played uh, Memphis, and Memphis won every single time. So, like, is that something to, to that we'll need to read into, or is that just going to be some sort of sidebar blurb um, that doesn't really have any bearing on things? No, I mean, I, I just wouldn't put a lot of stock into that because of the, the – the, for both guys, the programs are so different that they're running now. I mean, heck, Fuente's in a program now that has 65,000 Twitter followers. He's not used to that. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of and, and Taggart, Taggart has 360,000 Twitter followers. It's just they're, – they're completely different programs where I don't – you know, South Florida and Memphis, when they play on a random Saturday at Raymond James Stadium in front of 22,000 people – I don't know has much bearing. It's almost like a different sport than Florida State, Virginia Tech, Labor Day night in front of 80,000 people. Um, and and I know that coaches still have to coach what they have, but Willie Taggart's never had anything like this. He's never had talent like this. So I don't know. You know, and I'm sure the third, if he lost to Memphis in 13, I'm sure that South Florida, that South Florida team lost to everyone yeah. in 2013. Right. So I don't put, I certainly don't put much stock in 13 and 14 because that's when he's rebuilding the program. 15, I, I mean, I would be interested in how that game went, what the score was of that game. But I don't know that we can say, uh, you know, Fuente owns Taggart or Fuente has a, 
a decided coaching advantage over Willie Taggart. And even if Fuente is a better X's and O's coach than Taggart, he might be. I think Fuente is a sharp dude and a good coach. Man, if you don't have the talent, you don't have the talent. You know, that that's the whole bottom. That's that's it. Uh, Bobby Bowden wasn't a great, great X's and O's guy. He never lost to Frank Beamer. So, you know, and I, I'm not, and I don't know that he was a better coach than Frank Beamer. He just had a lot better players, and I think that's what you want with, with the Taggart-Fuente uh, dynamic moving forward. Uh, they were outscored 17-7 to in the second half in 2015 to lose to Memphis at home 24-17. to I don't Ooh, know. I mean, a little, little bit of a dagger there. Come I under, on. I understand. Was, what I understand what you're saying, and that you're you're more than likely right in this. And this is me just being a little bit provocative and trying to keep us occupied on, on June <laughs> right. 11th in 2018. But I don't like know, me talking about the Texas baseball team. <laughs> a couple, some of your sarcasm. My ears becoming finely tuned to it, but apparently we need to. <laughs> we need. They, we need they, to, I think they knew it. They just they were still getting upset. By they're like words. Aslan, say something, please. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean. Again, I'm I'm not saying that like you know Florida State is doomed in this game, but I think of all the sort of comparisons you can use, I, I think I would think that what Memphis had, I don't know, I guess Fuente probably inherited a, a better program than you know what obviously. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, he might have been, he might have inherited a mess. I don't remember Memphis being great in the early 2010s either. Yeah. So he might have inherited a mess. And I mean, I, but I don't know what you take away from like a 24 to 17 game. They were obviously very competitive. It wasn't like they were outmanned and outcoached and outgunned. I, you know, um, so, I, you know, again, I see what you're saying, but I, I, it's just hard to put anything in those first two years because Taggart was rebuilding it. Um, but I mean, I'm sure t- uh, on the flip, on what you're saying, certainly Justin Fuente isn't going to be intimidated at all about going into Doe Campbell Stadium, about coaching against Willie Taggart. He's beaten them three times. He knows he can do it. I, you know, I, so I, maybe there's something to that. I just think the programs are so different. The rosters are so different that it's it, – I don't know what you can take from a 2015 game, Memphis-South Florida, to carry over three years later between these two programs. Well, my thing is I just think those are two programs that probably by 2015 were on fairly equal footing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, I agree with that. Um you know, and Fuente, and I think they both, I feel like Fuente runs the same sort of offensive principles. I think he's a, he's an up-tempo spread guy. So it just feels like not, I'm not saying that like he's the, the rich man's Willie or Willie's the poor man's Fuente or anything like that, but that was just something that kind of caught my eye when I was like, well, dang, I'm like, they played three times and Fuente won all of them. So I wonder if that's anything that Willie thinks about if Willie's like, all right, you know, you got me when you were in Memphis, but now I got, now I got dogs. Now I got war daddies and mutants and all that kind of stuff. Right. I, well, yeah, and he, again, I come back to those Twitter followers. Yeah, I mean, you know, Florida State's got it, and those three national titles, including one in 1999, that obviously Justin Fuente's, uh, you know, stepbrother program doesn't have one of. Um, and, and yeah, I, you know, I I think Fuente's a really good coach. I you know I, I think he's a really good coach. He is. He is. I I don't know that you know it, it's all about fit. It's all about personnel, and you know. I think Florida State would be in good shape if Fuente was here. I don't know that they would be the recruiting juggernaut they're about to be if he was here, but I think they'd do just fine. And I think Virginia Tech's in good shape with him. I think they got to make sure to hold on to him. they got to hope that he's like a beamer and wants to be there for life because otherwise I think big boys will will start coming for him real soon. Um, and he might want to go to a program that isn't so petty about bull streaks. So that's something for Virginia Tech to look uh, have to worry about in the near future. Yeah, apparently USF went on a 96-yard drive to open up the game, and they scored a touchdown on it, and then they finished with like only over a little bit of, over 300 yards of total offense in that game. So yeah, but Fuente is not an offensive guy. Right? I mean, he's not a defensive guy, right? He's an offensive guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just so saying in terms of like was, wasn't Bud Foster. Yeah, like so, Willie came out the gates hot. Like Willie's like, get you some. Bang! Twelve plays, 95 yards in under six minutes. There you go. That'll make you happy, right? That'll make you happy, yeah. uh, no huddle, up-tempo Florida State fans. I don't like Jimbo Fisher. It's too slow, yawn, yawn, boring. There you go. Get some. 12 plays. Actually, 12 plays, 95 yards. That's very Jimbo-esque. That's methodical. Yeah, it plays, is. Yards. How many I, minutes did it take? 518. Does, okay, that's not crazy fast. And That's there, pretty fast for a 98-yard. I mean, you know, a Jimbo 12-play 90-yard drive would take literally a, a quarter and a half. Yeah. But – you know, five minutes isn't, you know, they're not whistling down the field real quick. So, again, remember also Taggart kind of, you know, that might, I thought, was that his first year going to that offense? 
the, or the yeah, Gulf first or Coast. second year. It was still in the. It was still in the. No, uh, I think this was yeah. Gulf Coast. This was the debut. This was debut of Gulf Coast, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 15 was because yeah, going into 15, his his seat was warm, warm hottish. Right. So I think that's when he finally did go ahead and um, and it was the third game of the season, I think. So fourth. Yeah. Sorry, so fourth I mean, there was the still there were still you know uh, there was still some transitioning going on, and it, it you know there were some growing pains with it. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, you know, it was you know I'm sure that was a pay, painful loss for the Bulls that day in front of fourteen thousand at Raymond James. Did anything stand out to you about the 2015 game? When they played in that rainy game in, in Doak in the beginning of the year, when USF came to town, I thought South Florida was tough. I mean, I did. I, you know, Dalvin, it, uh, the defense was good. They had a lot of athletes, and Golson was terrible. The, that is, all stood out. Is that, that's if, like if the Dalvin, go-to. That's the go-to line on anything from 2015. Do you remember anything about the game? You know, the Syracuse game, like. Oh, yeah, it was over with Everett Golson by that time because he was so horrible that Sean McGuire finally got an opportunity. Do you remember the Georgia Tech yeah. game? Yeah, Everett Golson, he was horrible. Do you remember the Miami I game? I think Golson had like one one game where he was really good and threw four or five touchdowns. Maybe NC State or Louisville, somebody he played really well against. Everybody else, he was just blah, just not g- good at all. And so, but I, what I remember about that South Florida game, that it was, I think it might have been like seven to It was tied at half. half. It was tied at half. Seven to three. That was seven. What up. was it? It was seven. It was tied at seven at halftime. Florida State scored first. Dalvin Cook, seventy-four yard touchdown. Right. Uh, that's really all they had. That was their whole yeah. offense in the first half. Was that one run? Yeah. Um, so, but I, I do remember. You know, South Florida was tough and they were aggressive. They melted in the in the fourth quarter, and Dalvin ran all over them. I, I remember in the in the second half when they just got tired and and their offense had no shot, uh, really, in my opinion. Their offense, the, the quarterback, he didn't want to run a lot. Against that team, like he, you, he wasn't running real aggressive after a few hits, and he couldn't throw, and that was a bad, that was a bad combination against that against that defense. Dalvin had two hundred sixty six yards on the ground. Uh, South Florida total yards two seventy four. Yeah, and then the next game to me was the more Willie Taggart s game, the one in uh, oh, well, you hope not, but the one in two thousand sixteen where Dalvin again ran for probably two hundred fifty yards again. And, you know, they kept, you know, they scored, South Florida scored on the 80-yard pass on the first play, then Dalvin scored on the 80-yard run on their first play. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think South Florida ended up with 35 points. And, you know, if their quarterback could have hit a couple wide-open guys, they would end up with 42 or 49 points. They just were not physical enough up front at all to stop Florida State. In either of those games, especially 2016, because I think Patrick ran for almost 100 yards. I think Florida State ran for like 400 yards in that game. And that's something where – but you saw what Willie wants his offense to look like. When it gets a first down, it goes super fast. And Florida State was on its heels the entire game. They had one stretch of like seven or eight drives where they did really well. But I think that was more the quarterback was missing throws than anything great that Florida State did. 647 total yards for Florida State in that game, 478 on the ground. I mean, that's crazy. That, and that's something you know you'd like to think. Moving forward, Willie Taggart doesn't have to worry about stuff like that, man. He he will never get completely outmanned to the point that he's given up 500 yards uh, rushing. But that's how outmanned he was in that game. And still, quite frankly, again, if their quarterback makes a couple throws, that would have been a game in the fourth quarter, like a legit game. <clears throat> I think that it, they got it down. They got the lead down to 14 a couple times in the fourth quarter, but it never felt dangerous because you knew Dalvin and Patrick were just going to run all over them. <laughs> Yeah, they couldn't get stops at all. But, you know, now he's got a defense uh, that I feel like he he um, can compete, obviously. At Florida State, you should be getting the best of the best. At South Florida, you're getting, like, the best of the rest. You're getting the best of some of the guys in Florida that can't get into the SEC or can't get into Florida State. They're, you get those guys. Well, he's got a huge pull to fish from now, and his defense won't be giving up 500 yards a game rushing anymore. You wouldn't think. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. That's over. Yeah, it's over. Harlan Barnett, This is kind of, the, when you think about it, I know he's only at Oregon for a year, but this is the first time he should have a real defense, a competent defense with NFL players on it to play with. Because, you know, Oregon's never good at defense. It's like they don't even know you play that. And then South Florida, you just can't get good players. You can't get great players at South Florida. You can get a, one or two here or there, but you can't load up in every section of the defense with great players. 
And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, – it's going to be – he's got to be loving life knowing that he's going to actually have a defense that can get stops, make plays, and have real NFL talent on it. Let's step aside for a break. It's Wake Up War Chan, 97.9 ESPN Radio. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source. He's Corey Maslon. This is Wake Up War Chant 97.9 ESPN Radio brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Uh, programming update. There will be no podcast, no radio show. This is breaking news probably to you as well, Corey. Uh, tomorrow, there will be no show on Tuesday. Uh, I will be down in Sarasota later today uh, on the latest stop of Willie Taggart's booster tour. He'll be back home. Oh, are you going to that? Yeah. Are you going to that on – he's in Sarasota on Monday? Yeah, that would be Tonight? today. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go down there and um, I guess, you know, kind of hang out with Willie again, just show my face, be like, yo, dude, out here. All right, well, then I guess I won't go to the one in Atlanta on Tuesday because that just seems like that's it's the same story. No, um, go. Go, bro. Go. Come on, man. Give the people what they I want. Gotta do he- I got to do headlines, so I, I might I might send it out. Especially if we if you're just in the one the day before, what would be the point of both of us going to two different ones? But I think but my angle, though, one, Corey, my angle is going to be your angle? my is less football and it's going to be more of like homecoming. Like Willie comes home, maybe like get Not up sure. with some of his friends. The rise of Taggart, Taggart Nation, hashtag do something. So. You obviously mm-hmm. being the more astute football mind of the two of us, maybe can do more of a X and O schematic thing. Uh, to no, 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 no. Satiate right, the palate. On, man. Who are you talking to? I'm not doing that nonsense. Uh, we all know the X's and O's of this team. I mean, he can only say Francois is doing what he wants him to do so many times. But I would be interested. The the one interesting thing about this booster tour that I'd really like to get some stories about and some insight about is like the like the Atlanta club, which is a really big booster club. Atlanta has a ton of Seminoles in it, and the, the Seminole booster club is one of the – it might be the biggest out of the state of Florida. Like, I think you're right. You know, um, what what's the different – What like talk to people afterwards and say, how did this compare to the last guy, especially near the end? Because I know there were plenty of booster clubs in recent years that were really fed up with how they were treated on this tour, if you want to call it a tour. Sometimes he wouldn't come at all. Sometimes he'd come and look at his phone the whole time, and he wasn't real personable. Obviously, Willie is on the uh, greetings tour right now, so he wouldn't be that guy, just like Jimbo wasn't really that guy in 2010 that he was in 2017. So it's going to be different in that regard anyway. But I would like to know, like, get a real sense of the difference from people that are there at these tours between now and then and what, what, they, uh, what they feel, if they feel more welcome, if they feel like the coach is more engaging – if it's all been awesome, you know, so I'm sure there's plenty of booster clubs that had great moments with Jimbo, but I, I, I feel like there were at least one or two times where he would, he didn't show up at the Atlanta one and yeah. Atlanta's a big one. You can't not go to that one. So, uh, you know, if I was to go to it, which would be a lot of travel because I'm already back in Tallahassee after spending the week in Atlanta and then I go right back up there for a, yeah, we'll see. As do it long. for the people. It's Corey. not like I'm digging ditches for a living. It's not <laughs> real work. So I might do it. I'll have to talk to our boss, man, and see what he thinks. Um, but, yeah, that's that would be my angle is is what has this been like for the, the boosters to, to see the head coach? What, what's what been the biggest difference between uh, then and now? Yeah. So, yeah, I'll be down there. Uh, look for content up on warchant.com uh, late Monday night and then throughout Tuesday most likely from uh, – Can't wait, buddy. The latest well, stop. so if I'm in Atlanta on Tuesday night, we'll pro- we, might have not, we might not have this oh. show two nights in a row. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, or I we, could call in. You could do a phoner. Yeah, I remember. You could just do a phoner on the way back. Do a quick podcast kind of thing and maybe won't do on the radio. Listen, folks, we like you listen to the radio. We appreciate it. All of our sponsors do as well. Uh, but if you don't subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the podcast. It just – it's just it's a very good insurance policy that has no premium. It's it's pretty much it's the epitome of win win. I mean, you can't lose by downloading the podcast. Subscribe, leave a review. There's really no risk at all, None. but a wonderful reward. Indeed, indeed. Hey, uh, speaking of stat dumps, I saw this on Twitter the other day. Uh, this comes from a guy uh, that's actually a, an SID at Clemson, but he went to Notre Dame. 
Tim Barrett. Maybe you know him. Maybe you mm-hmm. guys go back sometime. Yep. He's, uh, I think he's retiring. He's been there forever. Yeah, 40 years. 40 years. Yeah, he just announced year. his retirement. I've actually dealt with him only a handful of times, but he's always been really awesome and oh. polite. All right, I'm about to tear him up, so here we go. Oh, God, here we go. Great. Count on a good football season for Notre Dame in 2018. Years there has been a triple crown winner in horse racing. The Fighting Irish are a combined 108, 10 losses, and only five ties. 90% winning percentage with five national titles, six undefeated seasons, and seven top four finishes. I mean, that's just a good that, – that's actually something I would do. I wouldn't frame it like that, like count on a good season from Notre Dame because of that. But I would frame it like here's an interesting – sort of interesting tidbit because that's I mean that's fun but that's just goofy obviously it doesn't mean anything moving forward for Notre Dame's football chances that's all what are you talking not, about any a lot of causation when Florida State's got a quarterback with the uh, last name starts with the W good things tend to happen look perhaps uh, the yeah, best Weatherford perhaps the best softball player in Florida State history what's her last name start with W a dub. Jesse Warren. Yeah, a W you're right um I can't think of a basketball player yeah. that starts with a W. I can't either. Got Except me. Ward. I guess Charlie Ward counts there, too. Yeah, he got me stumped there. What what uh, Tim probably failed to mention in his tweet, though, is that uh, the Triple Crown winners date back to 1919, 1930, 1935, 37, 41, 43, 46, 48. So, yeah. That's you back know how we time. feel about college football records before black people were re- allowed to play football right. when it was only white people playing and no uh, Latin players, no black players, no players from American Fiji. None of those, none of them could play football, college football in the 1940s. American Samoa. Very few, I think you're, you're very about American few. Samoa. American Samoa. Um, I guess Jackie Robinson played football at UCLA back then, but it was, it was, it was not common. Right. So we don't count that. That's not real college football anyway. So awesome. Notre Dame, Notre Dame was awesome in 1919 when Sir Barton won the triple crown. Is that actual horse that won it? That is a horse that won yeah, it. The but first I don't ever. Know what it's year the first was. ever. Look Sir, at you. Nineteen nineteen. Yeah. That was a good year. Was that right? Yeah, Sir Barton, first ever Triple Crown horse winner. Was it nineteen nineteen? Yes, it was. Man, look at me. Look at me, guys. I, you, tell your friends about this podcast because <laughs> this is incredible. I know, I'm not. You know, people might think, "Oh, he's got his Wikipedia up." No, 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 no. He doesn't. Nope, that's just off, that's off the dome. That's that's just natural natural mental strength, which I like. Weirdly, it never really helped me with the ladies, the sports trivia stuff. It, it would help. I would go to parties in college sometimes, and I'd get to talking to other guys about, and they'd, they some of them would actually be genuinely like wowed that I could remember so much and I knew so much. But it was always dudes. Never did a woman come up to me and like, you know what? This is really hot. The fact that you know like the whole starting rotation for the the fifty five Brooklyn Dodgers. That's incredibly sexy. Makes Never sense. really happened. Meanwhile, my buddy, my best friend, was good at pool. I had another buddy that could play guitar and was really oh, good at it. Oh, yeah, game over. They had a little more luck with their with their talents than I did with uh, – than I, I don't know that pool is a huge turn-on yeah. either, but I feel like it's a bigger turn-on <laughs> than he, sports trivia. Was he Paul Newman or something? Is he out here just, like, you know, racking him up and knocking him down? I mean, it was really good and really impressive. I, You know, you are impressed when you watch him play, but uh, I don't know if it's impressive enough to, like, hey, I got to – go home with that guy it's all about the arena though Corey. like if you were it's one thing being around a keg and talking about sports it's one thing if you're like actually at a bar or like some sort of like you know like not a trivia where like no one knows who's answering the questions but yeah if you were like in a forum at a bar where you're like you're up in front of a microphone you're like just knocking all these questions out answering them some ladies would be like wow he knows his stuff no no because i've been in that forum before at a sports trivia contest back in the 90s i'd go every once in a while and do really well and it never mattered. Yeah, I mean, what if I'm winning a bar tab? It, I feel like I look more like a freak, like a like a like a like a complete and utter dork that knows numbers. The thing is, is I like most people that know a ton about sports trivia. Most sports writers in general, I think, in my opinion, are pretty unathletic and uncoordinated yeah. and just goofballs. Guilty. I was. I'm actually pretty coordinated and athletic for a sports writer, and especially for like a sports trivia nerd. I was coordinated, but you don't see that when you're just sitting at the bar going, uh, you know, it was uh, Johnny Padres. Like nobody, the, the women, it just did not matter to them in the least. Yeah. I might as well have been wearing a big sign that says, please don't talk to me. Uh, well, please talk to me, Corey. We got one more segment to do. It's Wake Up War Chant, 979 <laughs> ESPN Radio. Come right back. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 979 ESPN Radio. Wrapping things up. 
On this Monday edition of Wake Up or Jenna Maslon, he's Corey. The show's brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. You're listening to 97.9 ESPN Radio. So um, we tape this one as we usually do, so we don't have the full field of teams that have made it to the Super Regional. But have you watched, or to the College World Series, rather, have you watched a lot of uh, the Super Regional baseball at all, Corey? Too painful. Too painful. No, I can't do it. Yeah. Uh, no, um, I've been, you know, I was busy with Brady's stuff this weekend. Another, another good showing for him this weekend. Oh, yeah. well, if go? anybody's interested, I, do, I am, I know all of you are go on. Um, so he, you know, he did pretty well, but so now I haven't, I haven't watched a lot of it. I know that, uh, Florida lit up the number well, who one cares pick about in the draft. Them? How, 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 how'd Brady do? Um, let's move on to Brady. Oh yeah. No. So he had, uh, you know, he had a, he had a rip of a double in one game and then he had a quote unquote, quote unquote, inside the park home run in another which was a double where they threw it around the they you know they threw it around the horn and he scored. But the biggest the biggest uh, piece of good news from the weekend is he pitched well and threw strikes. Okay. Because at that level, when you're nine years old, man, that's basically if you can have just a little pace on it and throw strikes consistently, good things are going to happen. So that was good to see because usually he's a little bit wild, but he he dialed it in, man. Now he's like Greg Maddox all of a sudden. You know, football, no, no, I'm jinxing them, but yeah, football coaches always talk about, you know, I feel like high school football coaches are really like scrambling to keep kids uh, into the game of football just because of all the, you know, scientific evidence that points to it being a very dangerous game and families are scared about letting their kids play. They keep talking about, oh, there's so many lessons you learn about the game of life outside of football. Man, like I feel like being a pitcher, like if you're like nine years old, like on on a mound having to throw strikes, like the anxiety and pressure on you that like if you can figure that out, you'll probably be good the rest of your life. Just like as a human being, as a functioning member of our society, that's like I, I think honestly the, the the one thing that we never really can truly appreciate is like the amount of stress it is to throw a little ball over a seventeen inch plate and like get it there consistently. Yeah, and the good news is like in rec league ball. He would throw hard enough that none of the bad kids wanted to swing at it because they Ooh, knew they wouldn't be able to hit yeah. it. So they would just sit there and make him throw three straight strikes. Well, that's hard to do. But in this kind of ball, well, these are all good hitters. It's an all star. It's like an all star league that he's or an all, basically all star tournaments he's playing in. So these kids want to go up there to hit. So that's all. You know, he doesn't have to be right down the middle. They're going to swing. So that's good to see too. But yeah, man, it's uh, you know, he says he doesn't really get nervous, but also like the the one thing I want to the one good the one the best thing about baseball in my mind is it does teach you how to cope with failure because you always fail. Yeah. Even a good game, you're going to fail. Like he had two really good hits in one game. He also popped up with the bases loaded. You just have to, you, it's like life, you know, that's all, that's all sports is folks. It's a microcosm of life, but you know, you, you, you have good moments. You have bad moments. It's how you deal with them. And he dealt with his pop up really well. So it, it teaches that. It teaches that, you know, you can't let one at bat affect you when you go to the field. You can't let an error in the field affect your at bat. And so, you know, at nine, that's a little hard to do. It's still going to be some carryover. But, yeah, man, it's good training, not just for him later on in baseball because that career is not going to last too much longer. But, yeah, how you are with life. And, like, man, sometimes you're not going to get the job. You're not going to get the promotion. The girl's not going to come up and talk to you after you kill it in a sports trivia contest. I, I don't get it, but they wouldn't. But you learn to deal with it, and then you end up with uh, nice nice women anyway. Yeah, funny how that all works. Oh, we got to get going yeah. with Corey. There's, um, man, Florida State Athletics uh, rising up the Capital One standings uh, with the women's beach Chance, volleyball. Right? Yeah, I think so. Um, track and field. The director's pretty, Cup? Uh, yeah, Director's Cup. That's what it is. I'm sorry. I called it something else. Um, yeah, the Capital One Cup. That's like some sort of stupid mascot thing. That's yeah, Sorry about that. Don't, yeah, erase that in your mind, everybody. Uh, but, Corey, so how the track team do? Tracks back? Res resurgence? Renaissance for Brandon and the boys? It's close It's it's close to back. So the last two years, as most people know, about 10 years ago, Florida State won three in a row, although Ooh. one was vacated for nonsense. They won three national championships in a row, and they lost, like, two other ones by a single point. Like, they finished runner-up two or three other times. They were the best track team in the country, men's side. Well, then they went, they, they, got, they fired their sprints coach, who's a really good coach, Ken Harnden, uh, maybe three years ago, and he's at Georgia now. And so they've been they have been having to try to rebuild the program steadily. And I think last year they were 64th. They they were 64th at nationals. The year before they were 61st, and then this year they finished 11th, men and women. There we go. And and the head coach Bob Brayman thinks they're almost back to where they were. And next year they should be even better. He thinks next year they'll have a real shot. Uh, to compete for a national championship, and which is good because it, it, they should be. They're they're too good a program with too much history to not to be finishing in the 60s. 
But they, you know, they lost a couple of recruiting cycles because because of Harden, and he took one of the best sprinters in the country that was at Florida State. He transferred to Georgia. And by the way, people that anybody that knows this are, you know, that, that's in the track. Georgia did win the national championship in men's track this uh, this past weekend. But Ken Harden sprinters only accounted for eight of their fifty one points. It wasn't like. Harden was the difference. They they were awesome in field events. Now I'm not saying Harden's not a great coach, but I think people, if they knew that the guy that left, he had a he had a, you know, it was basically a power struggle with him and Brayman. Brayman won because he was that coach. So Harden left and went to Georgia, and then three years later, Georgia's winning the national championship. People are going to say, oh well, they Florida State obviously made the wrong decision. Harden was the key. Well, may, Harden's a really good sprints coach. I'm not denying that at all. But again, just keep in mind the context is. They scored 51 points. His sprinters scored eight of them. So, in fact, I think they would have won the national. I think they would have won the national championship even if the sprinters didn't score at all. So, it wasn't like Harden was the difference in this particular case. Now, it was a big gap. It was a big hole for Florida State to have to fill, but they're getting there, and they've got a really good recruiting class coming in that they, they think they're going to be uh, world class. A couple of these kids coming in, and so you know, and the, their best sprinter is just a junior. So they, you know, the women did really well. They finished 11th too. So, man, it's a uh, – by the way, real quick, before we go, people that are listening to this, go watch the 4x400 relay in the women's track and field championship I've from seen, Saturday night. I, I haven't watched because it's like four and a half minutes long in my internet. No, I just fast forward to like two and a half minutes in. Okay, okay. You don't need to watch all three legs. All right. Just watch – fast forward to about two and a half minutes, and then you're getting the last leg of the 4x1. Not only – USC has to win – the, I thought it's a four race. by four. Yeah, I'm sorry, four by four. Okay. Yeah, you, so it's one lap around for each runner. Yeah. So not only does U, USC has to win the race to win the national championship, they actually have to win the race to get the ten points. So they're in third place going into the last baton exchange, and then they run into each other, which is really hard to do in the four by four. You know, four by one that can happen, but you're kind of standing still. It's weird, but anyway. So they ran into her. They ran into the the girl that was running the anchor leg for the USC, and she's legitimately. I would guess 30 meters, 40 meters behind the leader from Purdue, even with about 100 meters left. And then she just sprints past her like she got rocket fuel up her butt. <laughs> it was inc- It's incredible. I mean, it, it really is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen on a, on a track or any, in sports in general. And I have no vested interest in USC women's track, I promise. But it's really remarkable. So if you get a chance, go watch that. I'm going to do it right four now. by four relay. It also, if you're one of the other girls that ran for Purdue, I mean, you would just want to throw the baton at the girl that finished. I mean, all she had to do is run a little bit at the end, and she wins. And she, Instead, she gets nosed out by a girl that uh, was 30 meters behind her when she got the baton. All right, uh, we won't be back tomorrow, I don't think, and Wednesday, I'm not sure either. We might put something together. Just keep uh, keep tabs on Corey's Twitter account, Corey underscore Clark. Corey's got E in it because his parents knows what's up. Um, and myself, right. Aslan Hodges, but that's a long story. Just follow Corey. He is Corey. I'm Aslan. That's Wicked Board Chant. Have a great one, everybody. Basad Cemetery, Osceola and Renegade, and of course, the War Chant. These are great traditions known to all Seminole fans. If you are a card-carrying, garnet, and gold-wearing knoll, don't you deserve a site that is truly dedicated to covering FSU sports? Warchant.com staff has over 50 years of experience covering the Seminoles. Warchant.com is the only FSU outlet with a full-time recruiting analyst in Tallahassee. Plus, it's the only site with a full-time videographer and a daily podcast 100% dedicated to FSU sports. Why act like Gators and settle for second best? Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.